But in the midst of the trial, John had a powerful vision. This is what he writes. When I saw him, meaning Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. I try to imagine being in John's situation. It had to be a time of great confusion and I'm sure great questioning for this godly man. In fact, I believe things could not have gotten much worse for John. But the first words that Jesus said to this servant was, fear not. The Apostle Paul knew this kind of desperate isolation. In the midst of his trials, Paul had a vision of Jesus standing beside him. He was able to declare in the midst of his persecution, all men forsook me, but the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. 2 Timothy 4, 16-17. So for Stephen, John, and Paul, their circumstances could not have been much darker. Each of these men had testified of seeing Jesus in their trials. And so... Dear Christian, this morning I have a question for you. Do you see Jesus in your present situation? Are you able to say, as these three men did, Jesus stands with me. He gives me strength despite my circumstances. I believe we're in a time in history when God's people need to rest in that truth that Jesus is always with us in every test, in every dark, dark hour that we face. Is your trial perhaps this morning a sickness of perhaps some kind? Is it unemployment? Is it a fear of the future? I can tell you that Jesus is there. The Apostle Paul wrote, I have determined not to know anything among you save Jesus and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2. I want you to see how Paul described his times to his young associate Timothy. We are in war. We are soldiers. So don't get entangled in the affairs of this life. You cannot please Christ otherwise. Endure suffering. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3 and 4. In other words, Timothy, do not get caught up in any cause or any transaction or any concern or anything that could disrupt your focus on Jesus. And we can see this demonstrated in Paul's life. First, Paul refused to get caught up in the theological arguments of his day. He lived in a time when there were a lot of factions and abounded on left and right. And they fought very bitterly. These parties were willing to kill for their doctrine's sake. But Paul responded to that conflict by saying, I have nothing to do with this. I am here for one purpose and one purpose only. To live and to preach Christ crucified and risen. And as a servant of the Lord, I refuse to get entangled in such affairs. He was later compelled to write to Timothy with the following warning. The Holy Spirit tells us clearly, in the last days some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites, liars, and their consciences are dead. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. You hear what Paul said about it? He's talking about our day. Paul is warning here, it's very clear that men will appear preaching another gospel. And the gospel that's offered by these charlatans will be a perversion of the true gospel of Christ. They will invent a new Jesus entirely. Right now, false Christ is being preached even in some of our evangelical churches. For theirs is a Christ who calls for no repentance. For theirs is a Christ who embraces homosexuality and same-sex marriage. Is a Christ of acceptance of false religions, all supposedly in the name of tolerance and love. Well, isn't that what they say? If we really are Christians, we'll tolerate it. If we really are loving Christians, we'll put up with it. True. Hmm. Paul responded very boldly to these perversions. He said, I'm shocked. What has happened to you in such a short time? I marvel that so many of you have become entangled in such a demonic gospel. And so he took issue. 
so seriously that he gave this instruction. Even if an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be a curse. Galatians 1a. And so we see the end result of losing focus on Jesus that Paul had preached. Today the church is not what it should be. All things are not under authority. What is our response to all this? We see the real Jesus, unchangeable Christ. He stands victorious over it all. All human invented gospels will not offer one iota of comfort in the hour of need. Isn't it sad that our so many churches have given over themselves to this? You'll see more of it. It's just the beginning. And so Paul instructs, we can't let even this kind of issue distract us. We're not to be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul also refused to become entangled in the bitter poli political battles of his day. You see, Paul was accused of leading a fanatical political sect. He was imprisoned and he was brought to trial before Governor Felix. He appeared in court. He had heard outlandish charges leveled against him. This man is a political zealot. He's a troublemaker. Stirring up the Jewish population worldwide, he is a Nazarene cultist. He is guilty of sedition. He is rousing great crowds against Rome. It was all a trap, you see, set by Paul's opponents. They were paid to bring false witness against him. But you see, Paul saw an even bigger trap. He saw Satan himself trying to get to him because Satan wanted to shut him up about the message of Jesus. Jesus is a central message. He was a skilled debater. Paul easily could have engaged his opponents, but he refused to become entangled in their political fights and agendas. He made that choice for the sake of the gospel he preached. Eventually, Paul was taken before King Agrippa to defend himself, but in the royal court, Paul had chose to preach Christ instead. He boldly told Agrippa his dramatic story, even at his own peril. King, I heard the Lord's voice. He knocked me off my horse and told me his name. He said his name was Jesus. The king was stirred by Paul's message. He refused to rule the apostle. Instead, like Pilate, he sent him to Rome to appear in Caesar's court. And during the night before Paul's transfer, the Lord stood beside him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you bear witness of me, Acts 23, 11. That was all the encouragement that the apostle Paul needed. When he appeared before the highest political leader of the land, Paul would still stay on, say on his message, Jesus is Lord of all. Satan is attempting to get the church off its message of Jesus Christ. I see it happening in every church. It's the reason why they're making apartments out of them. They lost their focus, didn't they? They've been concerned about everything else but Jesus. <clears throat> Satan desires nothing more than to turn God's people off this message. He does it by rallying Christians up over political issues until it consumes them. Many of our people in our churches are all divided because the devil has wound them up over political issues. They can't even set beside one another. And so the issue becomes all they want to talk about. But Jesus is no longer the consuming concern. Are there issues that God's people must care about? Absolutely. But not to the extreme that opens our heart up to bitterness and unchristlike activity. We must be able to pray without having a, dis a disturbed spirit. Our Lord insists that we follow nothing to rob us of his rest. God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some might fail to experience it. Hebrews 4.1. In 
closing with this. The testimony of Jesus is that we can be in this world, but not of it. Not of it. It means we don't take part in its spirit or of its pull. It's how we become a testimony of hope in a world without any hope. When some anxious person asks us, we can answer in faith and we can answer in confidence that Jesus is my hope and peace. We must have to be careful about getting entangled in the growing bitterness of today's politics. Apostle Paul saw the pitfalls of it, and so should we. Jesus has to remain very central in our hearts, in our minds, and in our doings, not policies or politicians. They are important, but they can rob us of our central concern, the gospel of Christ. Our confidence as Christians is that we know all nations will come under the authority of our Lord Jesus. Even though all around us the world is breaking down, but we see Jesus. We see Him in all of our present trials. We see Him standing with us in our pain. We see Him standing in our suffering. We see Him standing in our crisis. We see Him standing in all things. And most of all, we see Him getting all things ready for His coming. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Whew. Someone can go back and release those little ones to come in. We want to go to the Lord in prayer this time. This is why I kept 